Hi, my name is Rashid Ali. I'm a regulated Canadian immigration consultant from Canada. Regulated Canadian immigration consultants or RCICs are the only immigration consultants for Canada who can give you immigration or citizenship advice for a fee. In order to become an RCIC, you need to go through a certain educational path. There are certain licensing requirements and you also need to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. That's why the natural habitat for most RCICs is Canada. You'll find that most of the RCICs uh, operate and they have their practice within Canada. Through this channel, I share advice on Canadian immigration so you don't have to spend a lot of time and energy getting information from inauthentic sources. Hello everyone. Uh, today I have Mr. Tayyib Rasool with me. Um, he is an entrepreneur who started multiple businesses in Canada, in Alberta. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Rashid, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How about you? I'm very well, doing well, Alhamdulillah. Uh, so he took out his time, as you can see, he's traveling right now, but he took out his time very kindly to share uh, his knowledge and insights about starting those businesses. Taib, could you please talk a bit about your two businesses, which one you started first and, and why? Rashid, I came in um, Canada end of 2008, November or December. Uh, it's been 12 years now. Alhamdulillah, uh, time flies uh, really quickly. So a uh, couple of interviews had happened year 2009. So uh, as I was already working with my cousin, so I entered into a same franchise uh, very late 2009, uh, which I ran uh, until 2018 for uh, more than nine years almost. So I just left it a couple, uh, couple of years ago. Alhamdulillah, uh, I got settled with it. Uh, finished my transition period within 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 six months or a year maximum it took after 2009 in Alberta North in Canada. Meanwhile, uh, again, I felt out KR, uh, let's go for academia. So I went to uh, master's uh, for my petroleum engineering, although I had, a, I have actually a chemical engineering undergrad background from Pakistan and the Nestle Pakistan experience for almost four and a half, five years. So I went to university uh, with that business running 700 kilometers away, but went alone uh, by myself uh, into a different city, uh, about seven hours drive away from my hometown where that business was situated. So for a year and a half, I studied as a full-time uh, student, uh, lived in dormitory, uh, finished my master's, uh, very bad year to finish the master's, especially in petroleum in year 2015, where uh, all the businesses were closing down, especially oil and gas uh, related, where, which was my major in, uh, in master's. Uh, again, I came back into the business, which was already running through my family, applied in a couple of franchises for having a plan B, uh, first of all, for another business. Which franchise was the first one, the one that you had with your cousin? It was a, a Circle K and Petro Canada. Circle K was a convenience store, cash and carry business. And uh, Petro Canada is, of course, a gas, uh, one of the market leaders in Canadian uh, market for, for gasoline, uh, petrol, right? So, so it was that, to be exact. Then uh, I applied into, a, as I said, after doing my master's, after a couple of months in uh, mid of 2015, I applied into a, a franchise which had a fast food restaurant uh, chain, uh, very well known in uh, uh, many times of uh, very eastern province of, uh, uh, of, of Canada and Ontario, where Toronto is. And then it was uh, further emerging in Western Canada, in Alberta side or British Columbia side. So I applied into, because I was in Alberta, so I applied into that uh, fast food restaurant chain. A few interview session had happened in 2015. I got selected as a potential franchisee, it took us a year, and I opted a different city from Alberta North to Alberta South near Calgary, where, uh, which is actually Leth Bridge where uh, I started my first restaurant, having my convenience store and gas station all, all the running through my family and myself. So that's how I entered uh, in 2016 into a fast food chain where, uh, for which I went to Toronto for a month's training with my manager, then came back after a month's training, started that first restaurant. Uh, then my second restaurant construction started in 2018, mid of the year. Then I left that uh, Alberta North City as well as that uh, uh, gas station and uh, convenience store business uh, after nine years since 2009. 
And then I moved to Lethbridge, Alberta South, and started my second restaurant over there. Last year, I opened up another restaurant with my with my friend in Saskatchewan, a different province. Uh, that's also a fast food restaurant, but it's a different Japanese stir fry sushi kind of a thing. Uh, meals uh, being delivered and uh, and served. So I moved to the same kind of a quick serve fast food restaurant chain with my friend working 100% over there. And I'm being a silent partner or background partner with him in that franchise, which is also fast food food. The first one, the first two, in fact, were Mary Brown's, right? Mm, yes, those are Mary Brown's uh, fried chicken. And the second restaurant, which uh, second chain, which I entered in with my third restaurant, uh, that is actually Edo Japan, well established in Alberta, and they are trying to go and still uh, getting developed in Saskatchewan or so. So that's a sushi and uh, Japanese food restaurant. So uh, for the first eight or nine years, like you mentioned, since two thousand eight and nine, um, Circle K and Petro Canada. You, you you mentioned that you joined your cousin's business. Did you yes. invest in it? Were you working there as an employee to learn? How was that? I invested in it. It was about uh, 50,000 Canadian dollars in early 2010. Uh, I invested in it uh, as a potential franchisee as, and the current franchisee at that time. And then I got into it that uh, 50,000 kind of a range uh, Canadian dollars. I did not own any inventory, but it was kind of a business model where you give your security deposit, uh, open up your own company and that franchise is named on your company, which is yours. And they give the that uh, gas station and convenience store facility to your company, which is yours actually. So uh, it's basically my investment was about 50,000. Not too much, uh, which is uh, ideal for a new immigrant in Canada. So it is that kind of a business model where they give you, especially the Circle K, they give you uh, the facility to run and uh, f- for themselves, for them actually. And then uh, you run for them and with your own different company. And uh, so, yeah, security deposit is not that much, about forty, fifty thousand. 50,000. And how does it work? Do you have to go to Circle K and Petro Canada both or do they have some sort of mutual Circle agreement? K. Sir, it's, it's, it's a Circle K and they had a mutual agreement with the, with the gas facility, which is a petrol facility for Petro Canada. So basically it's a Circle K and Petro Canada was just a part of it. And uh, this is a very interesting business model where you don't own the land, you don't own the inventory, you own the business in a way. So what are the different types of business models with gas stations? Uh, basically with Circle K, this is how they work. Uh, you just own their name and they move forward with it, uh, with their inventory, with their equipment, with their maybe land or maybe a leased land, whatever it is. So yeah, in this scenario, you don't have to invest much, 40, 50 grand Canadian. Uh, you start with if they select you and then they assess you that uh, how do you perform and then they keep uh, raising you like they will move you from one store or one facility to another or bigger or busier so that's how it works whereas uh, if you go to any uh, petro canada or any other shell gas station companies right now they don't give any single facilities and they want you to have to own the inventory about 80 90 grand and then all the maintenance uh, uh, is all yours, uh, not equipment and land, but they further emphasize and even emphasize during the interview processes that uh, they want to give a cluster of four or five facilities uh, within the next six months or so. So if you have that experience and you have uh, courage to go for five, six cluster uh, stores, uh, five, six stores in a cluster, uh, that's what they try to, to go with. But Circle K, uh, they try to, uh, and they give actually individual stores. So this five or six clusters, does that mean that you have to invest five or six times 80,000, 90,000? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, 75 to 80,000, uh, a good sized store inventory plus 10, 15 grand uh, is a, just a security deposit uh, for the gasoline, like the petrol. Uh, although you don't own that petrol uh, or gasoline as an inventory, but you just give them per facility 10, 15 grand uh, as a security deposit. So if you have one store, it's about 100,000 investment uh, without land and without equipments. And then if two or three average is 90,000 90, average per location. Wow. Yeah. Uh, if something happens to the storage tank, which I believe is very expensive, is, is it your yes. responsibility? No, it's a company's liability. 
Uh-huh. It's the company's liability. Uh, yes, you uh, get your own uh, insurance, uh, which is your own company's uh, named on. Uh, but if something happens under the ground or if the the tanks are over the ground, uh, it's a company's liability. But yeah, it's a very serious issue otherwise. So is there any other model where you own the land and the tank and everything included as well? In the same thing, yes, you can. If uh, you want to spend a couple of million dollars, uh, you own the land and you go for it. Then you can have maybe one store. Yes, uh, with the land and with the store, uh, like the full gas station and uh, inside store, it's about 1.5 to 2 million uh, with the land investment. So it's about one and a half, two million thing for which you should have a cash of about 700. 800,000 a liquid cash so you could to go to the bank to go to the bank and get 50 percent or 40 percent or 50 percent out of it and uh, where was the circle k was it in lethbridge it was in alberta north it's a small town of 65 70,000 people uh grand prairie Uh, it's about four and a half hours drive from edmonton which is the capital of alberta to northwest uh, Grand Prairie and uh, so yeah it was a uh, quite cold uh, area minus 40 minus 50 is uh, minus 50 couple of weeks or two three weeks in a winter or five six months but yeah minus 30 40 is average uh, so yeah very harsh weather and if you had to get the same one in Edmonton or Calgary would it have cost you more in terms of down payment and deposit nothing really but uh, in Edmonton or Calgary which are the bigger cities. Uh, Calgary is the biggest one, uh, which is not the capital, uh, surprisingly. Edmonton is the capital, uh, is the second largest city of Alberta. But the real estate is uh, expensive in these bigger cities. So yeah, it might cost you rather not two, but two and a half million with all the land and all that stuff, with the construction. So maybe not 1.8, not 2 million, but two and a half million uh, in Calgary or, Alberta, or, or Edmonton. And I think that means that even with the first model where you don't own anything, even then the deposit would have gone up. Gradually, gradually, a year by year, maybe 50,000 would have been next year, 60,000. After two years, uh, 70,000 or something like that. Depending upon how the sales are growing of that Circle K store inside the store, plus the gas uh, liters are growing. So yeah, Circle K tries to increase your uh, security deposit level, which have which you have given them in the start. Maybe you left if your store sales have grown up after four or five years. So so yeah, it is definitely not fifty thousand, but maybe seventy thousand, seventy five, depending upon those sales uh, improvement. So um, this is an interesting point that you bring out. I, I was actually referring to the starting a store in a more expensive location and having to pay more. But you're saying this deposit keeps on going up. Do do we have to pay this every year? Yes. Uh, actually, whatever the remitting uh, checks uh, you have earned from them, uh, either you pay uh, in one time uh, or in 12 months of uh, the next fiscal year, they try to cut that just uh, as a monthly basis uh, to make that 10,000 by the end of that year. So, so that's even easier for any investor or any business owner that uh, you're not paying uh, and there's no interest on that. Uh, you're not paying anything in one go. So they divided that uh, whatever that increment was and used to be they divided into 12 and uh, you get the fair share of your uh, checks from which you have to get your own pay and your staff pay because staff you own by yourself at your own company in that model so you pay your own staff from your income which you get from circle k and even yourself too you pay yourself so so yeah uh, it was that kind of a model and just to expand on this a bit, when we're starting, we pay almost forty or 50000 in the beginning up front to Circle K. That's our security yes. deposit. Uh, keep th- those funds until you keep working with them. So for yes. five or 10 yes. years, whatever the yes. case. And yes. then on top of that, every year, how much do they get from the sales? How, how is that percentage determined? That's very difficult to assess uh, because uh, they pay you on the percentage of different categories of the inventory. Let's suppose uh, chocolate bars or uh, gasoline or uh, snacks, which are chips, Frito-Lay or Doritos or whatever, Old Dutch or uh, whatever the brands are. So whatever the categories are, uh, alternative beverages or soft drinks. So it's very difficult to assess uh, on Circle K's behalf because they pay the land as well. Either it's their land or it's a leased land. They pay the land lord the monthly rent 
they pay the maintenance of that whole store. You are not liable for the maintenance, any snow removals in the winter or any uh, landscaping in the summer or spring. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to worry about that. But again, I think uh, what my understanding is being in Circle K for almost eight, nine years, uh, they pay the franchisee, whoever is running on their behalf is about seven, eight percent. And they keep that share of uh, 10, 15% per store with themselves. You can't tell them that, okay, you know what, you are having that much income, so why don't you share with me? You can't You can't do that. Either it's a profitable or it's not profitable. They, they are with you. I mean, if it's not profitable, maybe they will end up the store or that facility. And may, if you are a good franchisee, maybe they'll move you somewhere else, right? Uh, movement is very frequent in Circle K if it happens. You can't say that it's on the profit. It's on monthly gross sales where you get your uh, income from them at the end of the month and then you disperse it in in your pocket as well as in your staff's pocket okay so they will just uh, give you a percentage of the sales and that will depend on the nature of sales nature of sales uh, yes yes Uh, but they keep you on they keep you on your toes Uh, they keep you on your toes (laughs) Uh, yes, it's a very uh, sometimes difficult to to run, but they do the inventories very f- uh, rigorous inventories every six to eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, like every two months, you get an inventory by them. Like by you get them. an audit. Yes, by them. They count each and every bit of the store, uh, whatever is the countable inventory is. They count uh, six to eight weeks. So in a year, there are uh, seven to eight inventories in a year. Uh, they make it with you and then uh, so yeah they keep on assessing you they keep on auditing you they keep on counting physically those uh, countable inventories okay and do they give you all the equipment like the accounting system the maybe computer and all of those things as well Uh, they give you all that facility which are related to that business but if there's any accounting aspects if you know the accounting you can do by yourself they they don't question right uh, because you are having your own company which is running that store and you own that company right but yes they, get, they properly equip you but as far as accounting or payrolling is concerned you are free to choose your own accountant yeah. or uh, well to do by yourself so now uh, the big question is spending 40 to 50k it might be affordable for a lot of people but in terms of a range a broad range uh, how much can one earn before you pay yourself and your staff? Ooh, what that's, could a, be the... that's very difficult. <laughs> that's very difficult. Again, uh, Rashid, it depends upon your sales, to be honest. Yeah. But uh, a thumb rule is 8 to 12%. Of your sales? Yes, which is yours by the end of the year or by the end of the month, right? Uh, so if that range uh, you are agree with, go ahead. But again, if your sales are low, uh, more, that range is still the same. Because uh, they are the main name uh, who want you to earn for them and want you to run for them. Here in the GTA, especially in the Halton region, Milton, Burlington, etc., I've seen yeah. a few store owners who told me that they can generate around 1.5 million annually. Is that also a, a fair average estimate for, for that region or... Or no That's doubt. very tricky. 1.5 million means uh, maybe 70% out of it is a gas. I mean, petrol. Yeah. Right. So like you go to a store, you buy one or $2, dollars, couple of snacks and you come out of it. Your main bill is four and a half, five dollars. Yeah. Right. But you go to a gas station and your per bill is 40, 50 dollars. Yeah. Right. So, so gas customer is the very heavy customer who pays, who fills the tank of his car or her car. Uh, averagely 40 or 50 dollars per tank yeah per car right whereas four or five dollars uh, for small coffee or small snacks or a couple of gums that's the bill so that 1.5 million uh, would definitely have uh, 70 80 80 percent i would say a share of the gas <laughs> revenue which gives you even one less than one percent sometimes out of oh. it if you own a gas so is is this even a good business model when you when you include the fact that you have to pay other people and you have to pay yourself as well. The sales are good, yes. Because uh, to be honest, uh, for my other businesses of fast food, uh, I didn't have anything about uh, unless uh, Circle K and uh, Petro Canada. I I earned from there. To be honest, yeah. I even did save for my 
for my studies too. In I didn't get any scholarship. I went for my studies by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, lived in a dormitory in a very luxury uh, apartment and uh, with a one vehicle along with me all the time and uh, paid for my own tuition. Uh, invested on myself uh, from from my business. Perfect. But yes, uh, one main thing I would like to actually convey to all the viewers that 90% uh, people think that Canada is all about Toronto. Yep. That's very wrong. Yes, 90% uh, population lives in Toronto or around Toronto or 85% of population of Canada lives over there in, yep. in the East. Western Canada has more potential, uh, but yes, lesser lesser population. Uh, but yeah, people think that Canada is only and only Toronto or Vancouver. Vancouver. That's, <laughs> that's it. So e even though a lot of immigrants come to GTA and Vancouver, and it, it, it is said that most immigrants spend their whole life uh, 20 to 25 kilometers within the radius of where they first landed. Why that's did you right. move to a very different place? Why did you take <laughs> this approach? Uh, took off from Lahore and landed uh, in Grand Prix from 10 million population to 60, 75, 60,000, 70,000 odd people. My extended family used to live here in Alberta. So that's why that was the, the purpose to, to come here. Yes, I lived a couple of days with my cousin right. um, in Toronto. But yes, uh, after third day, flew from Pearson, Toronto to Edmonton, drove further five hours, four hours to Alberta North to Grand Prix. Very interesting. Now, coming back to Circle K, how many employees does one need to run 24-7? Yes, it, it used to be a 24-7 and uh, even not used to be closed on at Christmases. All day, three shifts. Uh, so about eight to nine people. A uh, few full-time, uh, three or four part-time, depending how, how busy you are. But yeah, average is uh, medium-sized stores, five to six is an average per gas station, per convenience store. But yeah, I had uh, about... If I recall, uh, nine or ten people uh, at one time I had in the busy summer. Per shift, did you have one or two? Uh, in the morning, yes, two. Because, uh, again, lunch is busy. In the evening, is two. In the night, it's one sometimes. Yeah. And just to get into a bit of a detail, in, in the busy time, do you mean there were two people at the checkout counter checking people out? Is that why you needed two people? Yes. Ah. Because Circle K uh, or Petro Canada inside the store, it's all a self-serve kind of a thing. They, they shop all around in the store, whatever they pick in their baskets or in their pockets or not even in their buckets. They bring it to you and you scan it. Uh, yes, you take care of them whenever they are roaming around inside the store uh, so that nobody should vandalize. They ultimately come to you. You ask them, is there anything which they wanted to you try to help them? But yeah, try to uh, get them out as quickly as possible. In terms of their salaries, is minimum wage acceptable for these jobs or do you have to pay them more? Yes, minimum wage is acceptable as long as you're in bigger city. But if you are in smaller city where I used to be uh, four and a half hours away from Edmonton, I had to let them start uh, with a little above than an average median wage. And especially the night stuff is very hard to find, to be honest. And I did utilize... Uh, with the help of uh, Alberta and federal government, the temporary foreign worker program, I did uh, sponsor a few Filipinos and uh, bring them here. They used to start in night shifts so that I don't have any problem in the nights uh, to cover always. And yeah, that's how I worked in a smaller city, kept that temporary foreign worker program rolling and never letting me uh, out of the staff, especially you, for the night. So you got people on LMIA, you had to get people on LMIA even for these relatively median to lower wage positions because you just yes. couldn't find people locally. Yes, and do you contract with them uh, minimum one year or maximum two years? Now, another thing is, can, do you have to be in the store or can you just hire people and just visit on and off to check things around? Nobody will work for you unless you are there, right? So you have to be in your business uh, almost every day, five days a week or six days a week. To, to make them work hmm. and uh, I used to be in my store or my facility twice a day I mean not even once twice a day I used to always visit them in the night when the night shift used to start around 11 p.m. for morning 7 o'clock and the evening shift was uh, closing or used to close from 3 p.m. to 
to 11 p.m. So I used to always be there most of the times, uh, five or six days a week in the night too for half an hour. That what's to be done, what not to be done. And uh, if your presence is not there, sir, no, nobody will learn for you. Or your presence or your manager presence. So if mm. you, you can afford your manager, yeah, you should, why not? Stay at home for seven days a week with all your family and uh, kids. Uh, but if you can't, then you are your own manager as well as your own owner. So you mean you don't have to spend eight hours in a shift, but you have to visit them frequently in most shifts randomly? Yes, I used uh, to be honest, I used to go nine or 10 o'clock in the morning and then stay there for uh, three o'clock or four o'clock with them. Uh, Sometimes I used to work with them, definitely, uh, 100%. And then uh, four o'clock, five o'clock, come home, uh, have a lunch, a late lunch, I would say, have a tea and then spend time with the kids and then go back for half an hour when the kids are slept uh, after post 9 p.m. Uh, just to see what's what's happening and, and yeah if you afford a manager stay home provided he, he also is capable and i guess you can completely yes. trust them to take responsibility yes yes, yes. Mm. have you seen such models where people spent 50000 hired a manager in one location then moved to another and just passively managed it no zero very, ah. very less less than 5% i would say i haven't seen yes people uh, hire managers, uh, but if yes, uh, you have a few multiple locations, you can't be on every location, right? Then yeah. the manager comes into place. So, so yeah, then uh, you have a bigger room and bigger, bigger cushion to afford some managers too. So, right. So go ahead. Definitely. But even then your managers, you need to, to work very closely with them, not even showing yourself to them once a week. It won't work, sir. Unless it's a McDonald's. Why is uh, which, why is McDonald's? McDonald's easier? actually their systems are that strong that uh, you sometimes don't know who your manager is hiring, mm. right? So unless you have a McDonald's with you, uh, one or two locations or whatever, then you stay home. You don't need to work, <laughs> and they say that you don't need to work because uh, your payroll is all bound with their corporate head office. So they have their standard format and those uh, strong procedures whoever is the manager or staff they try to make it out for you if you are a mcdonald's owner, yeah, a McDonald's owner. like you mentioned it's not easy it is challenging you have to spend a lot of time you have to visit on and off it's a big responsibility if someone has an option of doing a job versus starting a circle k or a similar franchise what would you recommend in, in such a case I'm surprised that sometimes people calculate in this manner too, that not even a revenue, but they, of course, it's everybody's right. They want to gauge their time as well. How many hours will I have to spend and how much will I get out of it by the end of the month? Then why do I have to spend six, seven hours or eight, nine hours a day? Uh, to be honest, uh, when I started in uh, end of 2009 with my own store, and a gas bar facility. Uh, I spent uh, 16 hours, worked like donkeys. Mm. I have no hesitation to say, did our jobs at my own store, but I did it for myself, right? I was flexible enough. I was uh, uh, adaptable and uh, yeah, I had, to, I had to do for my own, for my kids, for my family. So I did spend more than 12 hours in a day, uh, worked uh, physically at my facilities for a good three years. Since 2012, a year ago, I hired a manager because I was going in 2013 to a university. So at least a year ago, I was foreseeing that I'm out of, uh, of this uh, for, for 16, 18 months, uh, 2013 onwards. So, so yes, then I hired a manager. And uh, by that time, I did work by myself every day. So do you think it's still better because you have flexibility? You have flexibility. As I said, I used to go at my store nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. So yeah. Uh, and then if I, I got free at 1 p.m., yes, after a couple of hours, it all depends how productive you spend your time in your store. If you want to be in your store 24 hours and nothing is showing any productivity, then there's no use. But if you spend a productive one hour or even a half an hour, then you don't have to stay all, all, all day over there, right? So that's the main thing. Whenever you enter into your office or your business, show productivity and that mean? quality. Whatever actions you, you have made in that one hour or 30 minutes, had it have any impact for a long run, for mm -hmm. your customers, for your guests, for your staff, for yourself and for your brand name, that's what I mean. Whatever their uh, planograms or scheme, schematics are, are you managing that? Whatever their 
programs are either a hot dog program inside the store or any other fast food uh, pizza program in that store in that facility are you running that uh, properly if not then you're not showing productivity and quality perfect and and do you have any any tips based on your knowledge on how to run such a store successfully that's what i would say i would say nobody will learn for you sir or madam mm. nobody will learn for you so yes if you have mcdonalds stay at home 12 months a year you don't have to come into your own mcdonalds but to reach up to that level you have to spend time in whatever the capacity you are working with uh, you have to spend time by yourself uh, don't think in a small canvas see a bigger canvas please please see a bigger canvas uh, like what is it going to benefit you after 3 years 4 years 5 years uh, like don't think about one month or one day or one week first of all this and i already said uh, toronto is not the canada western canada is also canada yeah. uh, people are scared of weather first of all yes i get that right so if you are to try to be in the business uh, western canada is one of the very potential places uh, inside canada so it's it's a very good insight that you gave and uh, someone who doesn't know much about canada maybe they have visited canada a couple of times how can one know which location to choose whether it's circle k or whether it's any other franchise how would you yeah. know what's the right location what kind of research can you do with Is circle this- k they don't open it for you whatever their their places are you work with them right similarly with other other uh, gas companies uh, you work with them but if you enter into fast food then you can have your own say that okay you know what i want to open up here or i want to open up here then uh, they might help you and they will toronto is again going with circle k it's uh, it's tough hmm. it's tough it's tough uh, because in circle k prices are a little higher uh, than regular grocery stores uh, to be honest uh, uh, alberta north was that kind of market where people did not used to worry about their pocket power they used to spend more now the f- last question about circle k is um, how can one get approved how can one get in touch with them and then get approved to open a circle k and what things do they look for um, in candidates i didn't have any business background but yes i did work with the full one year with my cousin who was already in that so that's why i get to know the insight of that business but yes uh, uh, doesn't matter if you don't have any that kind of knowledge or experience they still have uh, their uh, i think open uh candidates show up and uh, their shows uh, or their uh, sessions in edmonton and calgary uh twice a year i think uh, in each city uh, so people do show up whoever wants to think that they can be the potential franchisee for them on their website you can contact them they will they will guide you if there any that kind of uh, open house show is being scheduled in future or near future if not they will still try to assess your application okay. uh Tayyib bhai thank you so much for your time you've been very very helpful uh thanks for thank sharing you. your insights and uh, we'll do a part 2 sometime soon sure because thank people need much. to know what happens in the fast food business yes <laughs> this yes. is one aspect where you don't own anything you just give a kind of security deposit yes it's a bit healthy amount but not that healthy if you compare 40 50000 to a uh, 500000 or 600000 uh, that's a different story and that's a different ball game yeah and uh, we'll discuss that in our next episode so sure. thank you very much and take care my pleasure sir nice talking to you nice talking to you too so what business do you want to start let me know in the comment section uh, you need some professional help to submit your application to prepare your application uh, feel free to get in touch using the assessment questionnaire link that i have shared in the description and i will get back to you if you found this video to be helpful give me a thumbs up subscribe to the channel i share new videos every week there are more videos coming your way thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time